Hello and welcome to my strategy guide for parks. My name is Sam and today we're going to go over how best to use your hikers as well as some tips for gaining extra resources and managing your hand limit. This guide will just be covering the base game today but I will look to cover the Nightfall expansion in the future. While most of these tips will apply to all player counts, I've given them with three player games in mind. The two most important skills in parks are managing your hikers and managing your hand of resources. The hand limit of 12 resources is going to be a constant thorn in your side and will require a careful balance of collecting versus spending. Let's start with a basic valuation of all the resources. Trees and mountains are worth 1 point each. Sun and water are worth half a point each. Every single park you can visit follows this equation for their point value, which means they are all fairly valued in relation to each other. It doesn't matter which parks you visit, it only matters that you collect and spend as many resources as you can before the game ends. These resource valuations are also followed in the trail sites. You get two water or two suns to make up for the fact they are not worth as much as trees and mountains. The lower valuation of water makes canteens act as a bonus action to increase the value of your hand. Trading a water for a mountain adds half a point of value. Trading a water and two suns for a tree and a mountain also adds half a point of value overall. When trading resources, only look to trade up. Trading down from a tree to a sun only costs you potential points, so there would have to be a good reason to do so. Don't over trade though. There's no point walking around with six trees and six mountains. You will need some sun and water to visit most parks. The only canteen that does not offer point value is the one that lets you trade a resource for a wild token. Trading a water and a sun for a wild token is an equal trade, but still may be beneficial to keep under your hand limit. Wild tokens offer you flexibility, but ultimately can still only be traded as a one point resource at most. The difference in valuation is also important to note when taking photos. Spending two suns to take the camera and a photo is a fair trade. Using trees and mountains to do so becomes an inefficient exchange. Avoid using them when you can. If you have the camera at the end of the season, a single tree or mountain for a point is still reasonable, so always take that extra photo. The difficult part about hand management is the fact that there are so many different ways to collect resources but very few ways to actually spend them. This won't be an issue in the first season, as starting on zero resources with the limited number of trail sites makes it hard to reach 12. But as the seasons go on and you're starting a hike with six or seven resources, it's very easy to fill up and be forced into discarding extras. Visiting the Vista to take a photo can be a good way to dump some of these extra resources. The only other way to spend during the hike is by visiting the lookout. How early the lookout appears in the trail will really determine the pace of the game. If the lookout appears in the first season, you have at least 18 opportunities to visit a park, meaning you won't reach your hand limit too often. You likely won't have enough resources to visit that many parks, so it won't matter if they are cheap or expensive ones. If the lookout only appears in the fourth season, then you have at most 12 opportunities and will have a much harder time spending. In cases like this, you have to make the most of every opportunity you get and visit expensive parks to keep your hand size down. How early the lookout appears in the trail will also impact how much value you can get out of gear, particularly gear that gives you a discount on visiting parks. More opportunities to visit parks means more discounts and more value. When the lookout appears in the first season, it can be worth it to buy two or even three gear cards knowing you can make up the difference later. Let's look at gear in more detail. We've just spoken about the importance of visiting parks more often. The Parks Pass is a unique piece of gear that lets you do this. There's only one of them in the deck of 36, so it's not a reliable strategy to bank on, but when it shows up, it's worth paying attention to. If it appears in Season 1 or 2, this is nearly a must-have. Being able to spend all your resources with ease while your opponent struggle can single-handedly snowball the game in your favour. Gear that gives you a discount on parks, such as the journal or compass, would be ideal to get early on. The most obvious benefit is the saving you get from visiting a park with a mountain required. It's going to pay for itself very quickly. The not so obvious benefit is that these act as a way of increasing your hand size. 
Having your 12 resources plus a journal and compass means when you're visiting parks you actually have 15 resources available to choose from. You'll never need to spend that much on a single park, but it can be useful when visiting them back to back, like at the end of a season. The water bottle and tent are the only other two I find worth mentioning. Filling up your canteen for free each season is useful. What makes it great is the instant bonus of getting an additional canteen. It can be worth buying, it depends how much you feel you'll need the extra resources. The tent serves a few purposes. It allows you to visit and block the best trail sites multiple times each season, which can change depending on if you're looking to collect or spend. It also allows your hikers to stay one pace behind your opponents and potentially visit an extra trail site if played well. The amount of gear and canteens you want to get will vary each game. I find any more than three canteens to be overkill in most cases. Getting that much water to sustain them is difficult. Gear I will usually look to get anywhere from 0 to 3, depending on how early the lookout is available, and provided it's actually good gear. Keep in mind that you are limited to two end of season actions each season, so every time you are reserving a park or buying gear, it is at the expense of visiting a park. Early on this might be fine, but later in the game you want to make use of this as much as you can. Your personal goal, or year card, may not seem like many points, and in the grand scheme of things, it's not really. But as I said earlier, it doesn't matter which parks you visit, so there's no real reason to not work on your goal at the same time. The extra two or three points is often the difference at the end. The best year cards are the ones that require trees or mountains. There are more of these parks in the deck, and the resources themselves are more efficient to hold in your hand. Avoid the ones that require gear or visiting many small parks. These ones are more likely to work against what you want to do rather than with it. Also avoid the water year cards if you can. Water is the hardest resource to collect due to the fact that you will spend most of it on canteens and the river trail sites. Playing with the option of choosing your starting year card can help with your odds here. The season cards can provide a small way to gain an advantage over your opponents. When cards like the Season of Stone appear, it's useful to know that there are four ways you can get mountain tokens. The two most obvious ways are visiting the mountain trail site and filling up a mountain canteen. The effect also triggers when you trade for mountains, so the trading canteen and lodge work as well. Just note this only works once per turn, so don't fill up both canteens at once, space them out over multiple turns. The last thing to discuss is how best to use your hikers. There are two main ways to gain an advantage with your hikers. The first is to visit the most amount of trail sites. More trail sites means more resources. The second is to collect the most amount of weather pattern tokens. Most of the time you can't do both in the one season. There are a few rules I like to follow when it comes to moving your hikers efficiently. Save your campfire for as long as possible. If you use your campfire early, you become incredibly easy to block. I would only recommend doing this if there's a spot you really need to visit, like the lookout. But be prepared to skip many trail sites as your opponents try to punish you. Make sure you eventually use your campfire though, it is an extra trail site after all. Try to move forward as slowly as possible. It's okay to skip ahead a few spots, but skipping too far ahead will cost you resources as well as the opportunity to block your opponents. Getting your second hiker on the board early can help with this. Your second hiker should almost never overtake your first hiker. This is something I see a lot of new players do. You are not racing to the end. Every trail site is an opportunity to get resources or improve your hand. You may block your opponents a trail site or two, but by doing so you have cost yourself more. The only reason to do this is towards the end of a season to block an opponent without a campfire. Keep both of your hikers on the board as long as you can. Your hikers act as roadblocks, so having both on the board will be twice as annoying for your opponents. If your opponents are recklessly skipping trail sites, you may also get an opportunity to clean up the board while they're both finished for the season. Hiker movement is more of an art than a science. The best trail sites are going to change each season depending on your needs and gear. Just try to be as annoying as possible for your opponents by standing in front of them. 
If you can do this while collecting what you need, you will have done a good job. Hopefully these tips can help you. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I make strategy videos every week, so if that's the sort of content you enjoy, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and good luck.